second, sorry, the first line of specification, uh, we know the meaning of the id is id. Okay? So we get the meaning of id composed f is id composed with the meaning of f. But we know that this law holds for the meaning of linear transformations. Okay? So this is equal to mu of f, and the others are all similar. So it's really simple that the laws hold because of this homomorphic form, meaning the meaning functions distribute on the inside, on both the right and left, if these are qualities that we're trying to prove. Okay, so it's fine if you don't you know, follow, I really don't want to spend a lot of time on these proofs. I just wanted to impress on you that laws always hold, and they always hold for a very simple reason, because of these homomorphisms, and because of semantic equality. And these homomorphisms and semantic equality are arbitrary conditions. They're exactly the conditions that I want to say that I've implemented an abstraction. So, the linear transformations I have shown so far are very interesting. They're one dimensional, right? And that's why, of course, I was able to give such a simple representation. You know, every linear transformation is represented by one scalar number. That's not very interesting. So, you're probably used to linear transformations that are represented by matrices. So, where do the matrices come from? Where do all those numbers come from? And I'm going to suggest an answer. You said that you, you might put this in a in common or, or maybe quick check it, but it seems like wouldn't you always want to quick check this? Because that that's the whole idea of what an explicit contract is. You verify that you know before you run your program. Is there um, so the question is, wouldn't I always want to quick check it? Um, if I wasn't sure that I followed the discipline, yeah. If I follow the discipline, I can't. So um, I already know something more than quick check can tell me, which is that my program's correct. You know, quick check can't not tell you that your programs are correct. It can only tell you it failed to find that they're incorrect. This methodology tells you it's correct. It's a much, much stronger claim. Of course, without mechanical tools and so on, we might mess up applying the methodology. So you might want quick check as a backup or something. But it's still not going to do what this methodology does. It's still not going to tell you that you get the correct program. Okay. So, how do we do higher dimensional? linear transformations. Well, there are two more operations that we can have. And here they are. One is to say that if I have two linear transformations from the same type A, okay, but they go to different types, one's C is one, and one's D, I can combine those two into a single linear transformation that goes from A to C cross D. This is crosses, cross products, pairs. We'll use the rows C common D in high school. So that's one operation. Another one is that if we have two linear transformations that have the same output type, the same result type C, but possibly different input types. Okay, then I can combine them into a single linear transformation that takes the pair A and B and gives the value C. With these two operations, we can make um, linear transformations from sort of any nested uh, nested of pairs around scalars to any nested of pairs. Okay, so we can make higher dimensional or higher dimensional. So this is a bit maybe unusual, but in fact, this is exactly what matrices are about. Okay, the first one is the first one is uh, vertical stacking, and the second one is horizontal juxtaposition. So vertical and horizontal juxtaposition in matrices. Okay, another way to say that is matrices are just a representation for something, and the reason they have a two-dimensional structure is that you can think of matrices being built out of there are one-by-one -one matrices. And then you make all the others by, by uh, juxtaposing horizontally and vertically. When you juxtapose horizontally, the heights have to match. Okay, that's why A, that's why C is in both places. When you do it the other way, the widths have to match. That's why A is the same in both places. Okay, now, what's the semantics of these two operations? So, so now I'm saying I'm extending the specification. I extend the vocabulary, I have to extend the specification consistently. So it's quite simple. When I have this operation, so remember, so F and G, uh, they both take something of type A, and they give me a linear transformation from type A. So that's good, the meaning of it. This is in math, I apologize, it looks like this one. It looks like code. So the meaning of it is a function from A, and what is it gonna do? What's this gonna apply F to A and G to A? F of A gives me my C, G of A gives me my D. It's gonna pair them up. Okay, what about the other way? Oh, that's maybe a little trickier. Now I've got these two linear transformations, okay, these linear maps, and I have a pair. Well, okay, so I can I can pull the pair apart, apply F to A and G to B. 
But oops, they each give me a C, and I have to end up with only one C. I've got two C's, I need one C. Should I pick one at random? No, I should add them. Okay. Why add? Because it's about linearity. Okay, so this is specification. All right, so now I'll come back to the same question of, now what's the uh, algebraic abstraction that includes these two things? Well, it turns out there is one, it's a nice one. There are two of them. Uh, if you know control.arrow, okay, there's this arrow class. It's a bit sketchy. Um, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of cases where, I, where something is almost an arrow, but it can't be because of this method called R. Right? I look at that method called R. I can't make my thing an instance of this class. So, but there are, there are, there's, um, there's a standard mathematical notions called uh, products and co-products. And, and, they, and they go along with categories, okay? It's not theory, it's practice. So what do they look like? They're, they're type classes. And, and products add three methods. Extracting the left, extracting the right, and then this thing is often called fork. All right, well, that's a little more complicated because, because uh, the, 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 the products aren't necessarily Cartesian products, they're not necessarily pairs. Okay, it will be in this case, but not necessarily. So I have an associated type. All right, so the thing XL, this is what we call FST in Haskell, by the way. So in Haskell for when K is functions, okay, then these three guys have standard Haskell names, first, second, and triple ampersand. Okay, because the type of first is, it takes A cross B to A. The type of second is it takes A cross B to B. And the type of triple ampersand, which is really the same operation, triple ampersand comes from arrow, but it, it would work a little better if it came from this class, is we take an A to a C and an A to a D, and we get an A to a C cross D. Okay, now, there's this other notion, it's a dual notion, that's why it's called co-product. And what it means to be dual is that just everything's backwards, it's just a sort of mirror image of, of products. So instead of having two extractors, we have two injectors. Instead of having a way to take two of, two of these guys and um, create a product, we take two of these guys and we consume a co-product. Okay? So if you get, uh, extractions become injections, uh, producers become consumers, and product becomes co-product. So also there are, there are friendly guys who are kind of hanger-ons, which is uh, for products we have something that's like unit, and for co-product, which is, which is uh, it's like the identity for product. If you, if, you, if you pair something with a unit, you really haven't added any information, it's isomorphic to the original. And the same for sums, you can, you can sum on a co-product, you can, you can sum on something that has no elements. So unit has one element, so, el so the element has no information, Void, we call it void, we may or may not run into it, has no elements. That's the thing. If you know something, I have something in my hand, and it's either it's either a void or it's a cat. Right? Well, there are no voids, so you know it must be a cat. All right? So, yeah, so it just does have, have a little hang on. In, uh, in, in, in L and in R, where, where, how does the one in parentheses that does not come in as an argument get generated? <laughs> okay, so, so take NL, and it says, you give me an A and I'll give you an A plus B. Where on earth could I get the B? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's interesting. Now we have this in Haskell also. So, so in Haskell, for Haskell functions, the product that we have, uh, first and second are the extractors. Uh, for co-products, they're what we call sums, or either, the either type. So left has this type, it goes from A to A plus B. Right goes from B to A plus B. So where do they come from? Well, in that case, they don't have to come from anywhere because we, we just don't use it. We say, hey, I'm a, I'm a left of an A, or I'm a right of a B, okay? However, in this type, they do come from somewhere. Okay, all right, and we'll see that next. Really? Yes. Yes, here it is. Okay. So, given these two new type classes, they each give us 
um, automatically, systematically, uh, homomorphisms. Remember, homomorphism, homomorphism just means something that distributes over the structure of the, of the interface. Okay? So this interface for products, we have extract left, extract right. And when I say it, uh, the, the meaning function distributes to the inside, well, there is no inside, so it goes away. So the meaning of XL equals XL. That's, that's, the, that's the homomorphism for XL. For a right, the meaning of right, same as just X right. Ah, but the meaning of F fork G, I'm going to pronounce it fork. The meaning of F fork G is, well, it's the meaning of F and the meaning of G, and the fork of that. What's fork of that? Well, we'll find out. And similarly for the co products. The meaning of. Yes, that's a join. I did say that right. Just checking on there. Okay. So the meaning of F join G is equal to the meaning of F join the meaning of G. Okay? So I always know. I mean, I didn't have to think. I was just a robotyping there because that's just what homomorphism looked like. So now this is only helpful to us if we know what these right hand side things mean in our semantic domain, our land of meanings. Well, I wouldn't think that if they didn't have, if they didn't have actually that, you know, good, well established meanings. And it's this. So now I'm saying, now I'm going to tell you for the type of mathematical linear maps. Okay. Of course, this looks like code. It looks like Haskell code because Haskell is designed to look like math. Okay. So, so these equations are math. So I'm saying. So I have to, I have to tell three things. I have to give this. So this is the instance for linear for linear maps, mathematical linear maps. Okay. Of the product cat class. There's the class. Here's the instance. It would have been a little clearer, maybe if I written the instance. On the other hand, maybe it would have been more confusing if I had. So, so XL and XR act just like they do for plain old functions. They, it's first and second. Okay, but this guy has this interesting meaning. Actually, it does coincide with what it means for functions, too. So, uh, F for G is, well, I give, give an A, I just pair it, F of A and G of A. This, is, this sounds familiar, like I just said this a couple of slides ago. It's, well, yeah. I did. That's how this is going to end up working. And then for coproducts, well, it's a little weird. So in Haskell functions, a coproduct is either. But for these linear maps, um, the coproducts are not sums. They're actually products. So A plus B is A cross B. So, so the abstract notion of a coproduct is represented here as an actual Cartesian product. So anyway, uh, in linear algebra, it's called uh, direct sums. So in linear map, this is notion of direct sums. And that's what this is. So now, how do we inject? Let me get back to Dave's question. So here, I'm given an A. I need an A cross B. Where do I want to get B? Zero. Why zero? It's because we're really working with linearity. Similarly, uh, if I inject B on the right, I'm going to put B on the right, and I have to call it value for A, I'm going to choose zero. Now, what, is, what does this operation mean? Well, I already showed you what it meant in a little bit different context. So F uh, join G is this guy. Now, given this definition, so, so I didn't make this up. I did not make up these definitions. If you uh, read up on linear algebra, vector spaces, and direct sums, you'll see exactly this. This is what it means. So that's the point. When I design a library, I want to invent as little as possible. I don't want to leverage abstractions laws, reasoning, that have you know, been worked out for hundreds of years by mathematicians yeah. whose aesthetic matches mine, which is they want elegance and precision and reusability. That's why I'm trying to reuse math. So now from here, um, I'm just going to summarize and move on. From here, uh, we need to extend the representation. Okay? I'm going to extend it exactly by making these operations into constructors. Okay. So I'll define two constructors called colon. Okay, so I have now two more constructors. Now I need to extend the semantic function for the representation. Well, here it goes. Right here. You read this as, as the constructors. Now I've just completed the semantic function. Now given that, and given the morphisms, this specification, I can then derive what the uh, implementation of id and compose is for multi-dimensional linear transformations. I'm not going to do that here, but it's in a blog post. Actually, earlier forms in a blog post called reimagining matrices. I'm going to put these slides up. Uh, I'll link to them from the abstract, which is linked to from the wiki page. And, uh, and these guys are links, so I can follow. Okay, let's see, it looks like I have 10 minutes. 
Uh, oh, oh, here we go. I can actually put a slide up. So that, that's the kind of full picture. Uh, oh, well, I mean, it's not a full picture of the implementation. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was the other typo, or was that the same typo? So that's the other typo. Thank you, dear. Great, right. appreciate it. All right, so that's one example. This technique applies all over the place. Every time I do library design, and that's what I do, every time I do library design, I try to use this, this uh, paradigm. And, and to me, it's just, this is just like, this is what functional programming wants to be. In other words, this is what we can do that other folks can't do. All right, so functional active programming was the first, uh, I think was the first application of these ideas. Uh, this was something I did in the early and mid 90s. Uh, as when this idea evolved. And uh, functional active programming came out of one idea, which is continuous time, okay? So this was really uh, a deeply important insight. <coughs> There's a little bit of history, I don't have time to go into it, but I have a blog post called uh, uh, Early Inspirations and New Directions for Functional Record Programming or something like that. It gives some history. And this was really the idea. Um, this, uh, I heard this idea and I knew this idea was so good that I don't dare think about it until I finish my dissertation or I would never. Wrote it down, promised myself I wouldn't think about it. Uh, and then when I did finish and I started working with paper graphics, I brought up this idea of you know, functional record programming. So continuous time, but it was in a context, which is I had a discipline already, which I wanted to know what things meant. I had an